right, welcome everyone. It's really nice to see everyone's faces. I hope you've been doing well at home. Um, I'm Tessa, most of you know me already from CORE, and we are here today to learn about virtual public speaking with Shell from Chatterbox. Um, so Chatterbox is a um, professional public speaking, I should have said Shell is a professional public speaking coach. <laughs> <laughs> who operates under Chatterbox, and obviously I probably need some help by online presenting <laughs> as I stumble through this introduction. Um, but yeah, she's going to be leading our discussion. Um, feel free to ask questions. Let's have a conversation, and let's see how this, this session goes. I'm really excited um, for our first one uh, with Core Online. So, Shil, I'll hand it over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tess. So that wasn't a bad introduction at all. That was well, that was very well done. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you are safe and well and thriving in isolation and all those wonderful things at the moment. Now, as Tessa said earlier, uh, today is, is a discussion. You know, there are two ways today can go. One, I can either give you a full-blown presentation about the three keys to online presenting, and if that's the case, that'll probably go for about 20 minutes or so, 20 to 25, and then we can do some Q&A after that. Or the other option is over to you. You ask me anything you would like to know around pitching, presenting, online speaking, virtual backgrounds, the strategies that I use. I put a lot of thought and effort into the way I run my online presentations the way I link my presentations to my marketing strategy, my online strategy. And so this can even start to deviate from online presenting into what online strategies are in order to stand out. Because everybody at the moment is online. Being able to confidently speak online is one part of it. But then to capitalize on that, to build your brand, to build your business, to get more exposure and awareness is another part of it. And so under the public speaking and exposure banner, feel free to ask me any questions you have. And if there's anything which isn't within my domain, I'll tell you. And if there's anything I feel I can answer from my own perspective and my own experiences, I'll do that as well. And so what option would you prefer? Just pop them into chat. Keep your microphones on to mute for now, and we'll let you turn them on as we progress. But just pop your responses into the chat. And if you don't mind, when you do pop them into the chat, click the option to chat to everyone so we can all see what your questions are. And you can do that via the drop down on the blue box, which should pop up on your chat screen. So if you could let me know what your preference is, we can kick the presentation off or the session off in that way. Twenty minute theory first, okay. Amy says a mind either way. Okay. I'll just give it a few more seconds to see if everybody else is responding. Twenty minute presentation sounds good. Twenty minute okay, so the verdict is a twenty minute presentation. No, no problem. I'll run through uh, what I call the, the the three keys of online presenting. Now, I, I will also say this, as I go through my presentation, this is going to be a combination of me presenting online, me speaking online. I'm going to use my virtual background to present as well. So that might be a new thing for some of you to take away. I'm going to be using my PowerPoint as well. And to do all this, I'm, I'm going to move around. So at the moment, I'm on a stool but I'm going to move my stool at some points. And so this is gonna be quite, 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 a, quite a raw style of presenting in the sense that I'm going to move towards my screen to shift things around. I'm going to use my clicker. So there's gonna be a bunch of things that I do. After the presentation is over, I recommend we all take a two minute break just to give our eyes and, and our minds a rest. And so I'll start by saying this, in the last 12 months, I have delivered maybe close to 70 online presentations, 60 to 70 online presentations. And 
more than half of those have come in the last three weeks, as I'm sure everybody can appreciate why. Now, uh, to be honest, I've had such a good time presenting from home that I don't think I'm ever going to leave to get back out into the real world to present again. And uh, why, why would I? Yeah, I'm, I'm currently in my spare room where I have everything I need to ensure all my presentations run successfully. To my left, I have a set of LED lights, which give me the illumination I need. To my right, I have a, a camcorder, which does a live recording of all my conversations, in addition to the recording I have on Zoom. And the reason I've got that is because I use the feed from my camcorder for, for, for your micro content. I split that up into little bits of content, which I share onto my social media. Behind me, as you can see, I've got this clean, crisp screen, uh, as, or, or so it appears. Uh, now, some of you do have your visual screens there, but for those of you who don't have one, you see this. However, I see this. So what I've got behind me is a green screen. And essentially, it measures two and a half meters wide by two and a half high. And I've stuck this onto my spare room wall with blue tack. So there's nothing special about this at all. I use traditional blue tack to stick it onto my wall. Now, after I stuck this onto my wall, I had to design this background. And in order to design this background, there was one key criteria I had in mind, and that is consistency. Now, the reason I say consistency is because so many people are now online. I wanted to ensure there's consistency in my branding. Now, what I've noticed is a lot of people are going to my LinkedIn profile. The foot traffic has increased and the views of my profile have increased. Now, if you have a chance to visit my LinkedIn profile, you'll notice the banner I have, i.e. the image I have on top, looks a bit like this, in that it's got my expertise and it's got my logo on the far end. I wanted to design this in the same way. So when people go to my LinkedIn profile and then they watch me presenting, there's this brand by association. And I think now more than ever, it is so important to reinforce your identity and your brand at a time where we're all isolated and in some ways disconnected, reinforcing your brand and identity is super important. I also chose to put the logo for core onto this as well, because I think it's a way to personalize our conversation today. Now, I was also very conscious about my color selection. Earlier, we had a comment that it's a white screen, but this actually isn't a white background. It's a soft gray background. And I remember when we started the call speaking to Tessa, we were talking about why I haven't gone with white. The reason is because if you pick a clean background, like a white or a blue or a green or, or, or very clean, crisp color, it'll look glaring for your audience. Not only that, but you will look like a cardboard box, like an artificial cardboard box when you sit in front of your virtual background. And I can already see for some of you, it started to happen, you know, because your backgrounds are a bit too too clean. So I would recommend you tone down the color selection of your backgrounds. I've designed this on Canva. Now, for those of you who don't know what Canva is, it's a free online graphic design tool. And there are hundreds of thousands of options which you can pick from on Canva. I went to a section where you get to design proposals. I just cleared the template to a white blank template. And then I designed this. Now, when I designed this, I, I literally dropped the logos onto two ends and I wrote this via the text option. I then saved the logo up and then I changed the background to a soft gray. I then saved the design and I uploaded it onto my Zoom desktop app. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Zoom desktop app is, I'm about to share my screen and take you through a very quick crash course on how it works. If you cannot see my screen, just give me a thumbs down. You can, great. My opening slide is another opportunity to reinforce my branding. This is a white screen because it's done on PowerPoint. 
you, you can get away with it. So when you download the desktop app, this is what you'll be greeted with. And this sits on the bottom of your PC or, or your Mac. Once you click on this, a screen like this will pop up. And on the top right-hand corner will be, your, will be your profile. It'll be your avatar or it'll have your initials on it. And it's, you, you should be able to see it via a red pulse. There's a bubble. If your chat, if your chat grid appears on the right-hand side of your screen, you might not be able to see the bubble. So just shift your chat over to the left-hand side of the screen and you'll know what I'm talking about. You click this and it gives you a screen which looks like the following. Go down to the settings box and there's a red pulse going around the settings option. I'll leave that on for just a couple of seconds so you can see what I'm talking about. Once you click on the settings box, this will, will, will appear. Now, I'd like you to focus on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, once you click the settings box, there'll be an option called virtual background, and it's got a red flashing arrow that's just appeared. Click on the virtual background option, and then the screen on the right-hand side will appear. Now, this is actually a screenshot of my own virtual background option. And as you can see, I've got a couple of options there. This is where you upload your design from Canva. Once you've uploaded it, there are two critical boxes you need to tick. And there is a dancing box on the bottom of the screen, which identifies what those two options are. I have a green screen and the mirror my the video. It's important you tick these because Firstly, a green screen is the color most platforms will need to identify that you've got the ability to have a virtual background. And two, the mirror box ensures that your design appears the right way to your audience. If I don't click the mirror box, this would all appear flipped. And obviously we don't want that to happen. Once you upload your logo or your design and you tick the boxes on the bottom, shut this screen down which saves your work. And then I recommend you, you test it out. Ask a friend or a colleague just to log on to a call for a couple of minutes and see how it looks and give it a test run. Now in designing my backgrounds, I often pick a variety of options. As you can see, I have a logo here, but in other cases, I sometimes have a date. And the reason I have a date is because that applies for my international clients. When we work across the world in different time zones, I feel by having a date, it gives us a feeling of being in the same time zone, which just adds a personal touch to the conversation. Other times, however, I've even gone as far as having an agenda, and I drop the agenda on the right-hand side. The reason I have an agenda is because just like presenting offline, when you're presenting online, it's very important to have very clear expectations and guide your audience through exactly what you want to tell them. In fact, it's more important to do this online because you can't, aside from the little screens up on top, you can't see people or you can't read your body language or adjust to what your audience is saying. So give everybody a very clear path on which direction you want to take them on. Essentially, you you need to go from being a presenter to an online MC. And you need to MC your audience through what they need to do. And to become an online MC, there's three steps I recommend you take for every call. So firstly, familiarize yourself with whatever system you're using. So whether you're on MS, WebEx, Skype, or, or Zoom, understand the core functions of whichever platform you're working on. And then explain the core functions to your audience because all it takes is one person to be on that call who doesn't understand what the functions are. And that could be the one person who actually wants to buy from you or engage from you. So don't make assumptions. Be conscious of timing. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm gonna stop this presentation after about 20 to 25. And the reason I picked that time is because there was a study conducted by TED Talks. I'm sure everybody is familiar with what TED Talks is. 
and they determine that the longest amount of time we can pay attention to a presentation for online or off time is up to 20 minutes. In fact, it's exactly 18 minutes. And so be conscious of how long you're presenting for. If your presentations like today go for a longer time, I recommend you take a break every 20 minutes or so, because in doing that, it's not as draining on the eyes and the mind for the speaker and for the audience, but it also ensures that everybody remains engaged, which just like presenting offline is super important. If you lose your audience, if you lose that one person who logged onto your call because they're prepared to engage with you, well, then it's a pointless presentation. It's a pointless call. So ensure you take a break to keep people fresh because if you do so, it'll give you the best chance of maintaining engagement. Now, engagement online is a tougher exercise than it is offline. When you're offline, you might be presenting in a meeting room or a boardroom. You might be at a networking event, or you might even be standing up on stage speaking to an audience. And there's a number of things which you can do to, to maintain and drive that engagement. You've got the ability to move around, you can use props, and you can speak to people individually. Whereas online, you, the presenter, become a little box. You turn into a screen. And so it's important you make that screen fun and exciting and engaging for your audience to watch. And how do you do that? Well, I adopt a term that I call story teching. So that's T-E-C-H-I-N-G, story teching. Now, story teching is the online form of storytelling. If you don't know what storytelling is, it's the oldest form of presenting. It's when you use stories to tell your presentations. Online, it's the use of stories and technology to deliver your presentation. And in order to deliver stories with technology, I recommend you use a process called stunning simplicity. And that means designing stunning and simple slides to keep your audience engaged. How do you do stunning the simplicity? Through one of the best and oldest tools we have available, which is Microsoft PowerPoint. Now I'm assuming everybody knows what PowerPoint is, but there are three golden rules when you're using PowerPoint. And for those of you who do know, take this as a refresher, but for those of you who don't know, the first thing I would recommend is you use bold images. And that doesn't mean you'd simply jump onto Google and download images you find. Chances are they'll be blurry or they'll have a watermark on them, or you might even be done for copyright infringement. There are websites which have hundreds of thousands of free stunning images. And two of the websites that I use are Pexels and Unsplash. They're both free. You can download any choice of image you want. The only catch is you need to credit the photographers whose image you use. So when you download the images, there's a box to say, say thank you to the photographer. And that's all you need to do. You can then save that image on your desktop. Once you download these images and start to build your slides, please keep your text to a minimal. We all know this. You've heard of death by PowerPoint, but it is even more important online because remember your audience are watching a screen. And so if that screen is filled with text, they're simply going to read on. Pick out the keywords of whatever you want to talk about, drop the keywords in either your virtual background or on your PowerPoint and talk to your key points. And the last thing I recommend you, you, you do is you use animations. Now, I showed you an example of animations when I gave you the crash course on Zoom, um, but there are plenty of other ways to use animations to make your presentation fun. And animations will let you take your PowerPoint from just being a PowerPoint slide to a, a song and a dance, so it's more interesting for your audience to look at. And so how do we combine all these three into a PowerPoint? Well, I'll show you how. And in order to illustrate that, I'll use today's presentation as an example. And so to do that, I'm once again just going to share my screen, so bear with me. If you cannot see my screen, just give me a thumbs down, please. Perfect, you can. 
as you know, today, all of us are working from home. And we're working from, from home because of the measures in place with lockdown. We need to be isolated. And when we're working from home, you're either in your home office or in your dining room. Some of you might be on the couch or some of you, even though it's 10.30 in the morning, might still be in bed and you're watching this from the comforts of your bed. And there's no judgment if you're doing that at all. That's fine. But you've decided to tune into the core online presenting event, which has been organized by Tessa. And so we thank you very much for coming along. Today is all about how to stand out with online presenting. And I'm going to go through a couple of concepts with you. But it's also a networking opportunity. Whilst we're on a Zoom call, you can still see and connect with some of the community members, but you also get to network with me, the presenter, and perhaps meet some people who you don't, don't know. At every, event, at every event that you go to, when you watch a presenter, the hope of that presenter is that you walk away with one new skill. If you walk away with any, any more than that, we're happy, but if you can take away one idea or one skill, it's a successful outcome. And as difficult as it might be being at home, you might be stuck with family or kids, and I don't mean for that to come across in a wrong way at all, but we're all going through different challenges. It might be tiring on the mind, it might be tiring on the body, but it's a reminder that even though we're home, we're safe. And we are safe and we're in a position where we can attend things like this, watch presenters and be part of the community. It's a simple slide. It's got a little bit of text, but it's, it's an easy story to tell. And I can bet you, most people would have read through all those points as I talked through them. How can I take the same information, use stunning simplicity, use some nice looking slides and animations to story tech? Well, here's how. Today, we are working from home. And that means you might be on your couch or in bed, on your dining table or somewhere comfortable. Wherever you are, you tuned into today's event that's been organized by Tessa from CORE. And you've tuned in to listen to me speaking about how you can stand out with online presenting. And I thank you for your time for being here as well. By being here, it's also an opportunity to network and connect. Even though it's a Zoom call, there are members of the community who you might not be aware of, and it's a chance to connect with those members. Now, for those of you who have your chat grid on the right-hand side of your screen, there's actually an icon that I've just popped up. So in order to see what that icon is, please shift your chat box to the middle of your screen. By being here, it's also an opportunity to learn. You might be able to take away some new ideas and some new skills. And whenever a presenter speaks on their topic, the hope we have is you walk away with one new skill. And if you walk away with any more, well, job done and we're even happier. But being at home might be tough and exhausting for some of us. You might have to deal with family and kids and other things which you never thought you would have to contend with. But being from home is being safe. Being from home is in isolation, but despite being in isolation, it's still an opportunity to catch up on everything that's happening around the world, be able to keep up with the news and updates and tune into events like this. So as you can see, I took the same message and I converted it into a PowerPoint. And this particular slide took me about 10 minutes to design. So it's a bit more work, but it's more fun for your audience to watch this slide as you're presenting. I'm also conscious with the language I used and I timed my language to coincide with each animation. That does take time and practice to put together, but I recommend you leave your conversation organic and you organically time when each animation is coming in. How you design the slides is entirely up to you. It simply comes down to preference. And this is another way to show you the same information with a different background, a different frame, but I can tell the same exact story by using different animations to bring my topics in and remind us that even though we're safe at home, sorry, even though we're at home in, in isolation and in quarantine, we're safe and we're able to keep up with the news and events that are happening. So as you can see, same information done in stunning simplicity, 
through a technique that I call story teching. And I can explain how I designed these slides when we get to the Q&A. But regardless of the sort of topic you are presenting on, whether you're speaking to one person over a virtual coffee or you're speaking up at a team meeting uh, or, or, you, or you're delivering a client pitch, the concept of presenting online and offline remain the same. Prepare yourself, understand your content, and in this instance, get comfortable being slightly uncomfortable. Use this time to really hone your presentation skills and build your presentation skills. Use this time to build stunning slides which you can talk your audience through. Just don't make the same mistake that I'm making. Don't get too comfortable. Because eventually, once this pandemic or this crisis is over, we all will have to return to the real world. Uh, a world which means we have to get back to reality. A world which means we have to go back to speaking to people, to shaking hands again. And a world which, in my opinion, means we're out of the world that I'm in at the moment, that I'd like to call the matrix. And so use this opportunity Enjoy yourself in the matrix, build your public speaking skills so that when you are back in the real world, you can really show people what you're made of. So that's my 20 minutes up. I'll leave it there. Let's take a quick two minute break. It's 10.37 now. Let's come back at 10.39. Let's just, we'll just round it up to 10.40. I'll see you back then. Come back with some of your questions and then let's, Take this to a, a discussion and talk about anything that's on your mind. So I'll see you back on this call at 10.40. Conrad, just turn your microphone on now and ask your question. That might be easier. Go for it. Yep. All right. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. It was pretty interesting. Um, the question about the break we've just taken. So, so I know... Uh, you talk about 20 minutes uh, length of a TED talk, um, so I'm familiar with with that. Um, with uh, the online being online, I guess it's easier for me just to get up and walk away, or pick up my phone and, and go and do something. Having that break, um, and for me, what happened is my Zoom. Um, I think it froze. I'm not sure. I have trouble with Zoom on my on my laptop, where it freezes, it shuts down, and it starts up again. So I'm not exactly sure what the process was just now, but is there a chance that you can lose parts of your audience when you take these breaks? There's always a chance that you can. However, I take breaks after delivering so many of these and having understood what works for the majority of presentations that I've delivered. And after, deli after delivering so many, I've realized that 20 minutes to maximum about a half hour was the optimum time just to give everybody a chance to switch off from the presentation because it can sometimes be a lot of information. Whilst the stuff I spoke about, the concept is quite easy. Uh, it, I'm going to rephrase. It might not be for some, but because the concept isn't uh, intense, it's not as dr it, it's not as draining on the mind. However, if you've got draining information to get through, uh, 20 minutes to half an hour seems to be that sweet spot where it gives everybody a break, digest what you're saying, think about a few questions before they come back. But specifically to your question, can you lose people? Of course you can. The same way in a live presentation, uh, to some people, they prefer to go on for, for the whole two hours, but it also comes down to you as a presenter. Because if you feel drained and tired, you can't deliver the content you need to deliver in order to do your audience justice. Does that uh, answer your question, Conrad? Yeah, that's that's fine. Can I just because I, I think I had trouble with Zoom just now? What was I as the uh, an audience member supposed to experience on my screen during that break? Did, did Zoom actually shut down? Did you just go to mute and turn your video off, or what? What happened in those two minutes? In the, those two minutes, I put mine on to mute. Okay, so you were still there. I was still here. Oh, I, I went to the bathroom. 
<laughs> okay. All right. No, my, my Zoom crashed, so I wasn't quite clear if that was part of the process of shutting down Zoom or whether it was just putting it on uh, mute and, and I see that's what you've done. I, I put mine onto mute. Depending on the the presentation as well, I can just do this. So I'm, I'm just going to show you as an example. I can. Or if you wanted to, you can even run a PowerPoint through the background. Just okay. keep the screen going and engaging. It's entirely up to you how you want to run it. I choose to go with this because it's a clean, still background. Cool. All right. Thanks, mate. Oh, so if your Zoom is slowing down, then perhaps just have a look at your connection. Yeah, I, I have connection issues. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I hope that answers you. There's a question here from Angela about what to wear. So let me just first tackle that one. Angela, I always re I, I recommend you dress the way you would if you were going to work. So when we started this call today, I wore a jacket. I had a jacket on top of this, and then I noticed Tessa and I believe Quinton were on this call. They were looking quite casual. So I took my jacket off, and this is what I've got under it. I dress for my audience. This morning, I was an MC for uh, an, an event called the Five Speakers Project. And today, we interviewed Professor Gary, who is the CEO from NWA. And so for that, I, I dressed up. I had a jacket, a pocket square, shirt. So I've actually changed my outfits for the Zoom calls I have. But I even do that offline. All depending on the audience I see and the clients I'm seeing, I'll change the clothes I wear to suit. So what do you wear online? I would recommend you dress smart or you wear clothes which you would wear to work. Does that answer your question? If it does, just give me a why at the bottom. Or if there's anything else, feel free to turn your microphone on and ask me more. Great. Quentin, you've got a question for lo longer meetings, quite long. Do you want to turn your microphone on and expand on those, please? Yes, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, for sure for the uh, good advice. So um, over the last two weeks, I have facilitated um, two quite long risk assessments for, for clients remotely. And I'm normally the type of guy that's very engaging. So I'd be presenting or facilitating and then move around uh, and people and engage with, with them. So the, obviously there's some challenges um, doing it online. The one thing that I've found it, it is for longer meetings, it is quite energy draining because where you would be normally be walking around and engaging which uh, kind of generates some energy. Um, I'm sitting on a chair and having this facilitation where I'm not always able to gauge exactly um, the responses and things. So it comes down to that thing where sometimes you're not sure if someone is busy doing something on a, on a laptop or they, you're losing some attention and uh, things like that. So maybe a, a couple of tips maybe around, um, is it good to just show um, face and um, would you say that it, there is potential for you to actually, with your green screen, be standing up and walking around and facilitating? Um, and then with longer meetings, the, the breaks of 20 minutes or so, that becomes quite an issue. So normally we, we're working for an hour, hour and a half, and then take, take a break. Um, but taking those breaks, it's uh, one, it's quite a mission getting guys back good in time. Um, it obviously also extends the, the session if you're taking more regular breaks. Um, but I understand from my perspective and from the guy sitting on the other side of the call, the, it, it is definitely a, a lot more of energy, energy draining exercise. So you're trying to get through all of this and get, get the work done, but you, uh, there's certain things that needs to, uh, needs to adapt. So maybe if you've got some, some tips on, on facilitating longer type meetings or, or sessions. I'll answer the one about are you able to move around. Um, I'll answer that quite easily. I have a stool here at the moment.
Can you see me and hear me again? Amazing. Everything just fell, which was not, not cool. So I've just gone off my stool. And if I wanted to walk around without dropping everything and breaking everything, I can absolutely do that. So yes, I would recommend you walk around, especially if your sessions are longer. I would recommend as a presenter, you do whatever you need to do to get comfortable, to remain energized, have your water, do all those things to ensure that you are as comfortable and energized as, as possible. The one thing I want to know is though, why are your sessions going for, you mentioned here for six hours or for close to six hours. Can I just ask you why they're going for so long? And is it possible to reduce the length of your sessions? Um, so, so, so these sessions would typically be risk assessments, which under normal circumstances would be a full day session um, type of thing. So it's so it's, it's not it's always going to be be that long. So what I'm, we're definitely trying to do, for example, is just to do a bit more preparation or to um, work through things so that we cut out a, a couple of hours and from the sessions. But in generally, these are longer type type work sessions. So a normal meeting, uh, we, I try, always try to stick to 30, 40 minutes um, to, to make sure we get through everything, but there are some, some types of sessions that will take longer. And I think those are the ones that definitely for me, it's a, a lot more challenging. Yeah, so there's a couple of challenges there. One, on the presenter. You've got to maintain your energy. You've got to maintain your engagement. You've also got to maintain the passion for presenting. Because when you're going for so long, um, I'm making an assumption here, but you start to lose that, that, that drive that you've got to really engage people. Plus, because you're looking at everybody on a screen and you all become this little box on top, if you are a familiar presenter, you feed off that energy. And it's quite tough then to continue if you can't feed off that energy. So firstly, as a presenter, you, you've got to find your sweet spot. And if it m means your five hours ends up being five hours and 15 minutes or five hours and 20 minutes. Personally, I believe those breaks are so valuable because you have a chance to, to recharge. Your audience also have a chance to recharge. And if they have a chance to recharge, it gives them the energy as well to continue with the sessions. But then you've also got to make that session fun. I'm not sure what exactly is involved, but there are different things which you can do to make it fun. You can go into breakouts, you can go to whiteboards, you can make your presentation more interactive. So I'm not sure if you use a breakout, but if you do that, you've got the ability to split everybody up into teams and then you as the facilitator can actually step out of the breakouts while people are split up into teams having their conversations. And while they do that, it's something I've done in the past where I've split people up into breakout rooms. When they go into the breakouts, I then step away from that conversation, gives me a chance to refresh, to recharge. I then drop back into the rooms to see how everybody is going. And that's the way I run it. But end of the day, when you run a session for six hours online, it is going to be a challenge. It is going to be a difficult thing. The only thing I can recommend is try to reduce your content. Try to not go for six hours if you can. Is there a way to reduce it into two, three hour blocks? One done today, one done tomorrow. So that way it's not too draining on you and to your audience. And I think Angelo would like to add a comment into this. So Angelo, did you want to turn your microphone on and jump into this conversation, please? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I feel you, Quentin. It, it, anything that's involved with risk assessment at the moment, um, is going for two or three times longer, not just because we're all online, but just because risks are so high. And I've definitely found that taking a break every hour or so is certainly more often than you would normally um, allows people to absorb what you've been talking about. Because, and also if everybody's busy, it gives them time to actually go and address the other things that are bothering them and then come back again and pay full attention. Otherwise, you do wind up with everybody checking their emails, turning their videos off and not paying attention on you. Yeah. So I, I, I spoke about a few things there, Quentin. Your breakout rooms, yes, you do have the ability to move around. Make your screen fun. Make your screen interesting. And to do that, you may have to adapt and think quick. 
you may have to use your virtual screen as a way to present and then you may have to go into into powerpoint as a way to present as well but also set expectations from the moment you start speaking tell everybody guys i know we're in for five hours today if that is the case five hours is a long time to do this and so in order to ensure we all stay fresh we are going to be taking a break every x amount of time however long you feel is right so set those expectations but if you can try to reduce them into two three hour blocks or you know three two hour blocks because that means you can deliver more efficiently and your audience can digest better does that answer your question if it does just give me a why perfect uh, we've also got a question from renee you'd like to talk to me about my thoughts for looking around in camera so renee did you want to unmute your mic and have a chat Hi, thanks, Cheryl. Um, yeah, I really struggle with, um, as you can probably tell, looking at the camera, mainly because I feel like I'm talking to people. So I look at the person on my screen, but um, I'm worried that it, it makes me less authentic because I'm not really connecting with you because I'm looking at you, but not at you. Yeah. Um, so do you have any thoughts around that? And any, um, it, do you think it's really important or should I worry less about it? I think you shouldn't worry too much about it, but it all depends on it all depends on what sort of a presenter you would like to be. So I'll explain this in a couple of parts. For the most part, if I was to look at the screen, it would be okay. However, because of the experience I have in presenting, I look straight at the dot and I'm able to maintain my engagement to that dot. What I also do is, at the moment, while, I can, while, while I've got the grid on top of my Mac and I can see all of you, your grid just, just happens to be a tad under my lens. So as I'm speaking now, I'm looking at you in your specific grid. And it's close enough to my lens to make it look like I'm speaking directly at the screen. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if I do that, and if I look at the chat screen, it's obvious I'm looking at the chat screen. It also comes down to the distance you are. The further away you are, the more it looks, the more, the, the, the further away you are, you can't tell if you're looking at a screen or not. The closer you are, the more obvious it is. And so when it comes to eye contact, well, it, it, it is a challenge for a lot of people because to look at a dot the entire time can be quite a draining exercise. If you can, and if you're quite experienced in presenting or comfortable with presenting, I'd concentrate on the dot just like I'm doing now. So the last probably 20 seconds while I've been speaking to you, I've been looking directly at the dot. Alternatively, I can now switch my eyes to look at your little grid on the screen and it'll make a slight difference, but I don't think it's, it's enough to change the engagement. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. And I, I think it just requires a bit of practice, doesn't it? A bit of discipline. Or a bit of practice. And there's also the use of, of notes. So I can, I can, as I said, I was emceeing in the morning and I had, to, I had to ask questions. So I went down to look at my notes like so. I read my content and I only started speaking when I came back to the lens. I did not do, do this. So what are your tips for engaging with others on the LinkedIn platform? I read, my, I read my question, I digested it, and then I came back to look at the dot. So if you're speaking from your notes, that's a technique that I would use. I would read my question in my head, come back to the screen, ask that question to the lens, and then as the person is answering, look at that person either on screen, depending on, on how far away you are, or straight into the camera. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Tessa's got a question as well. Tessa, do you want to unmute your mic and ask me your question? Yes, I do. Um, so one of the problems I've been having uh, as we've been online more is I feel like I'm rambling a lot more. Like I'll, I'll know what I want to say when I start speaking, but then I get halfway through and then I think about how many words I'm saying and then I can't seem to stop talking. 
Do you have any tips on how to rein that in? <laughs> Your question is, you feel you ramble. <laughs> yep. Your, yes. So your, your question is, I feel I ramble. What can I do to stop the rambling? Yep. The simplest and clearest way to respond to that is by knowing exactly what you want to say and keeping it simple. Whenever we're speaking, so whether we're speaking online or in person, we feel as though there is so much going through our minds that we feel as though we need to say everything that's on our minds. And then we get distracted by how, what we think other people might think of what we're saying. We get distracted by the silence. We get distracted by one person who happens to look bored or happens to check their phone. And so when all these things happen, it throws us off and, and we feel, am I allowed to swear from time to time? Is, is, is that okay? Is that, yeah? And Absolutely. Feel, oh, shit. Why isn't that person paying attention to me? And we feel we, we, we just have to say everything that's on our mind. So I'm going to explain a couple of parts to this. We think at a rate of between 400 to 600 words a minute. And we speak at a rate of between 120 to 150 words a minute. Big gap there. Someone like a Tony Robbins speaks at about 200 words a minute because he's a motivational speaker. When you go to his events, and I've never been to one of his, he gets the crowd going and amped up so he speaks faster. When you're presenting, the pace of your presentation shouldn't be at a normal conversational pace. It should be slower. And what, what happens is because our mind is thinking so fast, we're constantly trying to catch up with what our mind is thinking. And then we get distracted by what we think our audience is thinking or what we think our audience wants to know or what didn't I say best way to do that is to one slow yourself down and by slowing yourself down take a deep breath before you say your sentence and then speak as you exhale now I do that repeatedly repeatedly whenever I speak I'll take a breath and then I'll speak as I exhale and that consciously slows me down but I also think about how can I simplify what I'm saying what's a way to to condense the information I have into as few words as possible. So that way I have to speak less and the audience can digest the information faster. It takes a little while to practice that and, and to put that in play. However, for any event you're presenting in, I would recommend a level of preparation. And it doesn't mean you script everything, but it's just be clear in what you want to say. Be clear in what your response is and the way you want your response to come across. And to do that, always ask yourself, what's the one thing I want this person to know? What's the one thing? If somebody's asked you a question and you want to respond to that question, it's happened to me today where I've had a, a number of things going through my mind. I filtered that down into what's the one thing this person actually wants to know? They want to know how I can speak clearly or how I can dress better, or do I look at the camera, or do I look at the screen? So I always simplify the question that's been asked, and I simplify the response I have in a way that makes it as easy as possible for my, for my audience to grasp what I'm saying. Does that answer your question, Tessa? Yes, that helps a lot, actually. There's some good stuff. Oh, am I muted? Simplify. No, no, I can hear oh. you. So <laughs> simplify. Always simplify. I, I, I believe when you're presenting, especially the more technical and the more complex your information is, if you can simplify that information, it's brilliant because it tells us that the knowledge this person has to take all of that and condense it into this in, in, in a way that everybody else can understand is brilliant. And that's as, 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 as Conrad can attest to, that's the concept of doing a TED talk. What's your ideal word spreading? 
that's a question that they always ask is what's the idea worth, worth spreading and how, how can you deliver that idea in a simplistic way for 2,000 people or 1,000 people to understand. If it's too complex, most people will just switch off because they don't want to have to think about it too much. They want to be, this sounds, this might sound bad, but, but we want to be spoon fed information as easy as possible. And so what can you do to spoon feed that information? Because if you can spoon feed it, it's like speaking to a child. <laughs> when you speak to kids, you just make it really simple. Would you like ice cream? No or yes. Just give me a straight answer. That's <laughs> Apply that same concept. Oh, well, obviously, don't speak to adults like you would to a child. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying. <laughs> <laughs> However, apply the concept. Keep it simple. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Josh, dynamic background. Fire away. Please put your microphone on and let's chat. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure if I logged in a little late. Sorry about that. I had another meeting go over. But... Um, so the virtual background I've been playing around with, but I noticed when you were presenting, you sort of had information coming down. Is that just you using multiple screens of a virtual background or is that some other function that I don't know about? Interestingly, I posted, uh, I did a LinkedIn post about this just yesterday because I did a presentation okay. on this just yesterday and I was asked a ton of questions about this. So if you, if, if we're not connected, please jump onto LinkedIn, connect with me. I've got a post which talks about this exact thing. But Josh, in response to your question, I designed individual backgrounds. Right. So when I jumped onto Canva, this was one background, this was an, an, another background, and this was another background. So I designed individual backgrounds, and I put those into Zoom in chronological order. Right. As I'm speaking to you now, the, the, they're all set in chronological order. So I've, I've got a tip. I've, I've got to hit the right arrow on my Mac. And as I do, it takes me through the different slides in the order that I want to tell the story in. Uh, cool. Got it. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a, a different way to present because if you can combine this together with PowerPoint, it gives you a lot more to play around with. Than, mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I haven't seen, in fact, I've probably, I've, I've, watched a lot of, I've watched a lot of presenters doing online in the last three weeks or so, and I've seen one other person do this. So it's not being done often. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, Zoom versus Skype versus Teams. What is your opinion from experience? People arrange session in different platforms, they don't see functionality. Quinton, I haven't, I, I only use Skype to speak to my parents in Kenya. My parents are in Africa. And the reason I use Skype is because they have it. And I just, my parents are in their seventies now and I don't want to take them through all the hassle of downloading uh, you know, to, you know, to jumping onto Zoom. So I only speak to my parents on Skype. I cannot answer that question because I don't have experience on the other platforms doing stuff like this. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that question for you. My experience, however, on Skype speaking to my dad and mom is great. Does anybody else have uh, an opinion on that question because it'd be great to have a chat about this and see if we can answer Quinton now. No? Okay. I use, um, yeah, I don't know anyone that uses Skype. Even people on Microsoft platforms seem to be preferencing Teams and Teams works really, really well. If you're like, if you're dialing into a company that's on a Microsoft platform like government or council or whatever it's like it throws it straight into their calendars um, it's just it's it's probably a better platform to be honest yeah the, uh, sorry go Renee <laughs> sorry the only thing I'll add to that with my obsession with the camera is that teams puts the photos of everyone down the bottom of the screen and mm. so my frustration with that is everybody talks to the bottom of their computer <laughs> 
so Renee, there we go. We've actually uncovered part of the problem then is is if if you're used to presenting on that and everybody's down on the on the bottom of the screen, then you're tempted to look at the bottom of the screen. So say if you were down down the bottom, I'd be talking to you like this. Where and that's not where your camera is. Okay, which adds a layer of, of extra awareness then. So as a presenter, you need to be even more aware and conscious in that even though everybody's at the bottom of the screen, you need to be looking at the top of the screen. You know, to, to do that, is there a post-it note which you can stick next to your camera? Is there something which you can stick up on the top of your laptop, assuming you're working off a laptop, to remind you constantly, even if it's an arrow saying, look here, and so that way, you're forced to look specifically at that dot, even though everybody's on the bottom. Because to them, you're looking at them. The only other comment I'll make is that from what I've seen over the last few weeks, Teams and Zoom definitely perform the best. I've seen a lot of technical glitches with platforms like um, WebEx. Cisco's Web WebEx is not coping with the increased demand. Um, I haven't had a lot of experience with Skype, but for anyone wondering about platforms, definitely Zoom and Teams have become the most robust ones under the current conditions. Absolutely. They have taken over the market. You know, and and I, I, this, I, 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 I hope this doesn't sound wrong, but if there's anybody in the world who's so happy with the pandemic that's going on, it's them. It's been an enormous boost to their business, and I, as I said, it's what we're going through is terrible. Uh, however, uh, you know there, there there are companies, there are people out there who are profiting massively off this, and so to them, this is the best possible thing which could have happened for their business. Any more questions, guys? I feel like they're drying up, and I would love to, I'd love to hear more. Is there a presentation that you are? Pre that you are preparing for, which which you would like to talk to me about. It doesn't have to be about today's talk specifically or about things that I've gone through, but do you have your own presentations or your own talks or or something which you, you, you might, have you got a pitch that's coming up or a meeting which you're participating in? Let's, let's keep the conversation going. Tessa, yes. Um, I have kind of an MC type question um, as we've been hosting kind of more community events. Something I've noticed, especially when there's a, a bigger group of people, is that as everyone's being polite and allowing people to talk, sometimes people will do what I do and just keep rambling and keep rambling and rambling. And there's not that in-person gentle interruption that you can do easily when you're in the same room with someone. Do you have any strategies to politely um, try to stop certain individuals from um, kind of overrunning the entire conversation. <laughs> oh yes, I do. <laughs> Yesterday, <laughs> yes, I do. In fact, it happened to me in exactly the same context yesterday. So yesterday was day day four of our five speakers project, and I was introducing Josh. I love your comment. Just to mute them. <laughs> I love that. I was introducing a, a uh, so uh, this person is one of Australia's number one sales speakers. You know, she's been dubbed as being uh, from, from, from uh, the female speaker, she's the number one in the country. And so we had her on this, on, on a webinar. And so my job was to introduce her and it was only supposed to go for five minutes and I had my spiel down pat but then she took over that spiel and started to talk and went on and on and and i thought i'm going to give you a minute i'm just going to give you a minute to do your thing and in the minute she was talking i i started to think about what where's the segue where can i find the right opportunity to interrupt you and how can i interrupt you online without making it offensive and there's a few things which i thought of doing one was this, you need to stop. Yeah, but I had a smile on my face saying, you've got to stop. Two, I sent her a message privately. Okay, just to, just, just, just so she understands that you need to stop talking because we're, we're, we're about to start. And three, 
I actually put my mic back on and said, Annette, I'm really sorry to interrupt you now, but unfortunately I am going to have to cut you off. And the reason I wanted to cut you off is because what you're saying is so interesting. I would rather save that for the main conversation. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna have to stop you there. Everybody, we're so delighted to see you this morning. I had to cut it off because we're on time. And so that's what I did. I, I spun it into a way that what you're talking about is interesting. I'm sorry to stop you, but I'm going to have to, because if you continue like this, the conversation is gonna go in so many different directions and we need to stick to what we're talking about today. Can you adapt that to your future community events? It does take a little bit of, of confidence and you do have, you've got to have a bit of, uh, not bravado, but that, but that's, you've got to have the momentum in there just to time it right. And sometimes there may never be a right time to do it because you're getting, you're getting to that point where you've thought about it, you've thought about it, you haven't said it, and now you're pushing the limit and now you really have to say something. And so you get to the point where you just feel time is up. So I would always give the person a minute or two minutes grace just to say whatever they've got to say and then find a way to interrupt but lead their conversation into the interruption. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think Renee has a comment on there too to throw in. Go Renee, please. Uh, really just an expansion on what you're saying there, Shil, but um, one of the things I love is that you made us turn the chat on, which I think doubles the effect by um, not just managing people who are talking too much, but enabling people who don't necessarily want to jump into the conversation, the opportunity to put themselves in the conversation as I just did then, because some people won't speak up because they think they're going to jump across someone else. So I think that's, you've got a twofold way of managing it there sometimes. So you get everybody talking, but, but there's a protocol for people to jump in. Yes. I normally set that protocol, actually, I always set that protocol at the start of the conversation. And I will tell people to use the chat function. So this all, it's part of being an online MC. Because if you're, an, if, if, if you're presenting online, essentially you're becoming an MC, as I said. And to become an MC, one, understand the system, understand it really, really well, or at least understand the core functions of the system you're using. And something as simple as the chat box where you've got the drop down from everyone to private, explain that clearly so people understand, oh, we, we do have an option there to chat to everyone or to have a private chat. So set those expectations at the beginning. If you're introducing a speaker, ha have a call with that speaker prior. So I spoke to Tessa just yesterday in preparation for, for, for today. And I asked her, so how are we going to run this? She said she was going to do an introduction. I then said I would take over from that introduction and I would explain to everybody that we've got a couple of options to work from. So we had a system there to work from. But if you do find yourself in a position where the speaker is taking over or, or somebody just keeps, or just keeps going on, you've got the chat function to tell them to stop. And if you really have to, you can just mute them. Say, I don't want you to be on this call anymore. You're gone. <laughs> That's when you push to the real extreme. <laughs> Angela, you have a comment. Would, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, I was just going to say, it's the same, particularly with the community stuff, because you're getting the same people again and again. Um, <clears throat> it's the same as in the real world. Sometimes you just have to preempt with that person, either before the meeting or before they start speaking, that there is a time limit and you know, they need to be really conscious. Just do it nicely. Correct. So going back to yesterday, the project we worked on was we had five speakers over five days and each speaker was doing 8.30 to 9 a.m. I emceed the opening five minutes, did a quick introduction, thanked everybody for coming, asked everybody for one question just to get a bit of conversation going. Then I then introduced that speaker. So we committed to everybody that it's going to be 8.30 to 9 a.m. And in that time was MC intro and Q&A with the speakers 
presentation in the middle. This particular speaker went over time, and by the time she was done, it was 8.59. So I had to cut the presentation off, and I was honest and said, look, I'm so sorry to do this. However, we committed to everybody that we, will, that we would be done by 9 a.m. I hate to cut you off because it is so interesting what you're talking about. And so in order to continue this conversation, guys, I, I dropped her contact into the chat. So at least there's a way for people to connect with her, encourage people to connect with her if they wanted to finish that conversation or if they wanted to finish the presentation. And then I also said, because we're out of time, can I just do one quick question? And you've got a minute to summarize what that question is. So I set that expectation very, very clearly, saying we're out of time. However, I'd love to know one quick thing from you. Can you summarize this in a minute? And she did. And eventually we, we, we were done by uh, a minute past nine. So it's very important to plan it with the speaker before you get onto the call, understand what your role is, how long you're going to talk for, what you plan on saying, give that speaker their parameters, ensure they stick to their parameters. That way, if you do need to cut them off, well, you've told them already. If you do go over time, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to cut you off, so please be conscious, be aware. Nobody ever complained about a short speech. Uh, uh, Shu, this is a... I have another question for you, just following on from this discussion. Yep. Um, uh, around the etiquette of your audience, is it, uh, and and what you did at the start of this presentation, you you talked about how you were going to the presentation, you mentioned the, the chat box, um, but is it worth, or, or would you ever consider that sometimes you might want to explicitly state the etiquette for the audience? Um, for example, uh, don't answer your phones, um, things like that, or is that being too prescriptive? Or maybe it's worth it's something you only do for your your team that you're responsible for at work, and as opposed to something like this, which is a, a slightly different setting. Sure, I so I'm I'm going to give you my take on this. So every 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 call I've run, every presentation I've run online or offline, I actually do the opposite. And so I, I didn't do it today. However, the etiquette that I en encourage is, and I, I tell people, we're all adults here and we're all busy. And I know how important it is for everybody to have their phones close by. You might get calls of, job keeper at the moment, or you might get a call off your spark, your something. There might be something you're waiting on. And today we have a two hour call. In those two hours, if there's something which pops up and you need to attend to it, go attend to it. However, if you do answer your call, I request that you put your cameras onto mute. You switch your camera off and you put your microphone on to mute. I've, I've gone the opposite way in that I don't, tell people to mute their phones because I think we're all intelligent enough now to do that. I encourage people to answer their phones if they need to do it. But I just say, if you do need to answer your phone, just step away, please, and just pop your microphone onto mute. Uh, I didn't do it today, which is an unusual thing because I normally do, but that's a good point you raised there. It just comes down to preference and style. I've, I've been on webinars where that explicitly say, we want you to put your phones onto silence and we'd rather you didn't answer your phone. But I know there are people who've answered their phones on their calls. There are, there are people, I can see that there are people who are checking their emails and their messages while I'm speaking to them, yet they're trying to make it appear as, 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 as though they're not. I, I know it's happening. And it's okay to do that. And, and I think we should be allowed to do it so long as the speaker understands that we're talking to human beings and human beings go through distractions. You might have a dog which comes into the room or your kid comes into the room. If it happens, deal with it in your own way as long as you don't distract the rest of the community. And if you feel you're distracting the rest of the community, switch your video off and, put, and just pop your microphone onto mute.
Does that answer your question, Conrad? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Perfect. I, I like the positive spin. So, uh, cheers. <laughs> you know, because how how often have you been to events and somebody goes, "Could you please put your phones on to silence or switch them off?" You know, I'm not going to switch my phone off. I'm going to keep it on, <laughs> and it's going to be on silence. And chances are, I'm going to have a look at the LinkedIn profile with the the notification which has come through or the message that's come through because we're human beings and we get easily distracted. H Hamish, far away, do, would you like to put your mic on? Yep. Sure, thanks. Sure, hi everybody. Um, let's have a question about this vocal variety and putting emotion in your voice. So yep. I need to teach a lot of I guess, dry, boring topics about databases and I have been told that I need to put more emotion in my voice to keep people engaged. Um, but I, when I do try and do that, I feel fake. It sort of it doesn't naturally come to me. Do you have any tips for for, for doing that? To try and keep, keep Can people engaged. A dry and boring pitch. So, what are you pitching? Mm. Um, I'm mainly teaching. So, teaching online about just geological databases. So. Um, a lot, a lot of technical terminology. Okay, so you 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 teach people online about uh, geology, do you? Um, in, in a nutshell, yeah, uh, both online and offline. But. Okay, okay. And the feedback you've had from people is that your voice is too monotonous. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you deliver often? Do you present often? I'm um, just getting into it at the moment, so not not often, probably uh, once every couple of months. Okay, so is it fair to say that you are a new presenter? Uh, definitely. Yeah. Frequency of how you're presenting, you are a new presenter? Yes. Okay. If you are a new presenter, ha having a monotonous tone is perfectly normal uh, because it takes a little while to build that confidence within yourself to go from having a monotonous tone to having a bit of fun in your voice, you know, to having a smile on your face at the right times and to injecting an elevated pitch and tone and to using your body language. But that does come in time. If you start to force yourself to do it, it won't be authentic and your audience will be able to feel and sense it's not authentic. My suggestion to you is instead of doing a presentation or instead of doing a pitch, do what I'm doing and just have a conversation. And you'll find when you flick it from a presentation to a conversation, you end up being more of yourself. And you take the pressure off presenting because there's a certain uh, pressure element which comes with the word presenting. You know, when you're, when you're stepping into a presentation as opposed to stepping into a conversation, there's a different feel to the subject. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I guess you're saying like instead of reading off your slides, you just have a main point and then talk about it. So totally, totally. I, I would, I would, I would strongly encourage you. Even though you are a new presenter and you're building your presentation skills, I would strongly encourage you to not read off your slides. Hmm. Assuming if you are talking about a subject in geology and you're now delivering presentations, that you're familiar with the content you're presenting on you know the content you're presenting. And so when you combine the nerves of presenting, the novelty of presenting with an audience who in your mind feel might be judging you for the things you say and might be, there's a magnifying glass on you. Therefore, everything you do and say is amplified. And so with all these thoughts going through your mind, when you start to read off a slide, your voice automatically goes into this fear factor mode and your voice becomes scared and monotonous. My suggestion would be, as I said earlier, keep it, keep your text to, uh, keep your text to minimal. And when you keep your text to minimal, let your conversation organically flow. Because if you can let your conversation organically flow, it goes from a presentation to a conversation and a conversation should make you feel a bit more comfortable. However, given it's early days for you, don't be too concerned that your voice is at, at it's, 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 a, it's a monotonous tone for now. 
uh, that's how most people start. I certainly started in that way, and it took me a while to inject the, you know, the personality into my presentations. But that it it takes a while. I just do it as often as you can. And any type of a situation you're in where you're presenting, so say for example, yes to Angela's point, it's perfect. You know, speak to one person in that audience or. So what I did when I when I started to get into presenting was if I went out to dinner with my family or my friends, I would take everybody's order on the table and then I would call that order out to the wait staff. Uh, on a Monday night, I go to soccer. So what I started to do was at the beginning of our game, I would deliver the team tour because by doing all these things in a somewhat comfortable environment, it started to build my confidence in speaking and presenting. And, and I was then able to apply those little bits and pieces of confidence into training rooms, into meeting rooms, and into presentations. Does that make sense, Hamish? Yeah, and that's great advice. Yeah, definitely. Just keep, keep practicing and you know, keep yeah. the conversation going. Not doing stuff like that, but ultimately always be you. I mean, does, it, does anybody remember what happened to me about 20 minutes ago? Well, when everything fell over. That's... Everything literally <laughs> fell over, man. <laughs> I had two choices then. I could have either really stressed out, panicked, and thought, oh, if I'm a professional speaker and everybody's re re really going to judge me on this and it's, it's, it's going to damage my credibility. And I could have thought of all those things. Or I thought, oh, I'm a human being and these things happen from time to time. And if anything, I'm going to swear again, everybody, I'm sorry. I'm allowed to fuck up from time to time. And I just happened to fuck up today because my wire got caught in my stool. <laughs> and, and, and so I just took it in my stride. I switched the video off. And as I did, I could see the looks and everybody going, is he all right? What happened there? <laughs> but I was okay. And so I chose to, I admitted that it was a mistake on my part to have the wire going th through my stool. But... I'm okay with it because it happens from time to time. Anybody else have, have any questions? Are you okay to keep going or would you like to take a break? I'm comfortable to keep going, but it's entirely up to you. I'm just having a look at the chat. If you want to keep going, just pre just Break, please. Absolutely. Let's take a two minute break and we'll come back at 1133. I'll see you shortly. Jill, how are you going? Good. How are you? Good. I've been tinkering with my background while we talk. Okay. Um, so without bothering everyone with it, do you think, I'm just kind of looking at text size. It started off as this big in the background. I don't know. It's like it's it's probably dependent on how big someone's got their screen set to, doesn't it? Do you want to give it a, t a test and show me? Because even though you've got your yep yep, I can see it. It's so that's little and then bigger. Yep, it's working. I can see them both. Yeah, I'd rather. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure whether to stick with the large one or smaller. Possibly my audience is old, so I should stick with the bigger one. If your audience is old, I would stick with the bigger one. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 background you have you you've got there that's a virtual screensaver. That's a, that's a background which shows a boardroom, and plus then you've got the logo on the side. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm quite, I'm fine with using Photoshop. Can I just give you a thought on that, please? Yeah, please. Yeah. My comment on that is uh, when, when, when you start speaking and your background appears, I'm tempted to look behind you. I'm tempted mm -hmm. to look at what's inside the boardroom. What are the people doing? I'm interested in, in we're, we're, we're curious people. Human beings are curious people. And it's, and it's why it's so interesting because everybody's now at home and, and, and if, if people have their cameras on, it's so interesting to see, oh, what books are they reading? Or I wonder what 
is that how they live? I didn't think they would have their laundry there. You know, we, we just start to think of all these things because we're curious people. And, mm-hmm. it, and, and it's, an, it's an insight into somebody's life. And so when I see yours, I'm tempted to look at what's behind you, which mm-hmm. sometimes can be a distraction to what the speaker is talking about. Yeah. I'd be conscious of that as well. Okay. Yeah. Hamish, while we were taking a break, there was something else I thought about, which I'd like to share with you. Uh, So when I give my presentations, workshops or keynotes, there's a process that I use, which is similar to what I teach for TED Talk. So I, I coach TED, TED speakers. And whilst there isn't, uh, a, there isn't a script or, or, or uh, a system we, we go through, there's, there's something that I apply for all the TED speakers I've ever coached. And that, that is your what, your why, and your why. And so when I put, put that into the work you're presenting, understand what you're talking about. So firstly, what's your idea worth spreading? What's the one thing you want your audience or your, or your students to know? And then two, I ask why. Why do you want them to know this? Why is it so important to spread your message? And then three, why should they, why, why, why should they give their time to listen to you? And so whenever I present, I, tick, I find a way to tick all those three boxes. And in doing so, it gives, me the, it, it gives me the clarity that I need to articulate my message in a way that covers all those three, your what, your why, and your why. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, definitely. That's that's a good tip. Um, it's good structure to yeah, the structure your presentations around. Definitely. What's your message? Why do you want them to know your message? And then why should they listen to you? So just work work with the framework, work with that structure, and build your workshop, or build your presentation around that. Tessa, fire away. My question is more for kind of startups and people that are trying to pitch their ideas. Um, I've been watching, I've been tuning into a few demo days and um, kind of pitch sessions that have been taking place online. And I've been finding there's kind of a mix between people that are able to make kind of a highly produced video or animation and people who aren't. And for the people that don't have the resources to make a really fancy schmancy um, cool video to display their technology. And the other thing to mention is that a lot of the startups that we work with does take a bit of explaining because some of the products are like pretty niche or the technology is new or it's a system that's working. If you can't rely on kind of outsourcing your presentation and you don't want to take up too much time or just being spewing out jargon. Um, how, what would your advice be to kind of find the happy medium to standing out kind of against those flashier videos and content? Sure. So your question is a lot of the, the, the clients you have who work in your community have to pitch and sometimes the, the, the product or services or technology they have to pitch is quite complex. Some do it well, some don't do it well. And the ones who don't do it well, uh, what can they do to articulate their technology clearly and concisely with technology and with good, good PowerPoints and good presentations? Is that what the question is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Okay. <laughs> In one word, simplify it. Now, I understand, I completely get that some some technologies have a lot of information behind them. However, I have worked with a number of engineers, startups, tech firms who've got, I mean, some, some of the people I work with see the world in 1001. <laughs> they see the world in binary. It's a different language. I, I don't understand their language but I do understand how, how they can take the language and go 
and consolidate it into that. Because no matter how complex or technical your information is, in Conrad's case, space, you know, it is, it, it's a very cool thing. Uh, people know space about being this black part of the world with stars in it. But I'm sure in Conrad's mind, there's a lot more involved in space than just that and the technology involved in that as well. However, in Conrad's mind, he would be able to see his product in a, in, in a simplistic way, in the way that that's got to be delivered to people to make them understand it. And so if you're time poor, technology poor, the things I recommend you can do. So say, firstly, if you wanted to produce a video, uh, for those of you who want to wear a week ago, I released my first ever rap video and I posted it onto LinkedIn and thankfully it's done pretty well. And it was a rap about ice ice baby with the coronavirus. <laughs> it's crazy. But anyway, I recorded that on, on, on my laptop. I used a virtual screensaver just like I do now. I went onto iTunes and then I used and then I used an app on my Mac to blend the two together in order to produce the video. It took me a couple of hours to do it. It wasn't a difficult exercise. So there are ways to produce your videos and animations on something as simple as a MacBook. There are also ways to uh, if 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 you're developing a technology, I assume You've got a team of engineers there who are developing your products and technology for you. And if you've got a team of engineers who, 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 are, who are doing, who are, who are making your technology, they've got access to tools on their computers. And part of those tools could include stuff like 3D animations. Because in, in order to build some types of technology, you've got to see all elements about it. So, I'm sure there's a way to build a 3D animation, a simplistic 3D animation, and drop that animation into a PowerPoint. I've actually seen that done through some clients I work with. It isn't complex or over the top. Uh, it does take a while to do it, but it's not a very complex exercise, especially if you've got engineers who are working on your team. How, how can you then deliver that message? Well, this goes back to what I said to Hamish. Your what? your why and your why. When you're in a pitch environment, the pressure's on because you're pitching something. Generally, you're pitching for capital. You're pitching for investors. And so the pressure is on to make your pitch sound good, but also to make you sound like a credible expert because nobody's going to, excuse me, because nobody's going to invest in you or your company if you don't have the confidence to pitch and present it well with the material or with the technology to back you up. So it's pulling together that entire story to keep your pitch as short and concise as possible to impress the people that you're presenting to. How can you do that? What, why, why? Whether you're delivering a TED talk or a workshop or a five minute pitch or an hour presentation to a board of directors, the model of what, why, why applies. You just have to adapt it into whatever your outcome is, to whatever your desired outcome is. Does that explain what I would do in a simplistic, in, 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 in a quite a simplistic way, Tessa? Yeah, I think so. I think it's uh, about pr approaching creatively and finding creative solutions that look, especially with the technology we have, now it's easy to with rudimentary even products and software to make something that looks pretty good you absolutely can there are there are you don't have to outsource things of course if you of course if you've got the money to outsource then you've got to sometimes you've got to spend money to make money and if you're going for a pitch that's a million dollars you know if you're going for a million dollar pitch a half a million dollar pitch you know, it's a lot of money invest a little bit to 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 spruce up your content you know invest a little bit to make sure that when when you're stepping into the room you're stepping in with the confidence that your pitch and your supporting your backup is at a level where your audience will say yeah i can i can see why i why i want to spend a million bucks on these people so you've also got to determine what you're going for if you're going into a room and you're asking for 10 or 20 grand you know you can probably get away with something a bit less 
in my opinion, I would still go through the same effort. Whether it's 10 grand or a million dollars, I would still go through the same effort because you never know where, where, where that can take you to. Uh, I did some work with a, with a petroleum engineer and he was talking about a pump and he had to deliver this pitch to his executive team and the pitch was in order for for him to step up to and to a senior role he had to impress them with the work he had done and he simply took 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 the model of the pump which he was presenting on and instead of doing a powerpoint talk with the notes and the logos and animations and so forth he got his design team to have one single slide of that pump and that pump did a swivel for about three minutes. And as it swiveled, the different parts split away and each, and as each part split away, he spoke to that part. As he spoke to a certain part, it went back into the main, main pump. Another part then, then, then split away. He then spoke about that a particular part as it came back into the pump again. So, there were creative ways for him to use a single slide with an image of a pump that swiveled and broke away at, at different times. And it was probably the equivalent of a 2D avatar. It was nothing special and over the top, but the creativity and the thinking behind it made him stand out because he actually got, he got the role, but he had to put a lot of effort into timing his talk around the brakes and that particular pump pump. It is possible to do it. You just have to think outside the box and how you do it. Anybody else have, have any questions? So something that I've been doing a lot of is, is exposure. Um, and all my presentations while I, while I present online, I back it all up with with the information that I that I with with, with what I talk about on things like my LinkedIn. You know, so I, I I often, in order to warm my audience up for the presentations or a pitch or or upcoming in, engagements I have, I'll often talk about my skills and expertise on my LinkedIn, so that as people consistently see the messaging I have it positions me as a thought leader in my space. And so then by the time I step into a room with, a, with, with an executive team or, or, or work with an organization who want to employ me, who, who want to engage me, they've seen enough of my content so that by the time I step into the room, they already know who I am and the work that I do. And that's a combination of my blogs, my videos, my articles, my posts, and I often share posts which give away the value of things that I do. And I'll often even share my IP on, on my LinkedIn, but I'll just share enough of it to create a bit of a teaser so people can see that this is my world, this is absolutely the space I work in, but I have to give away some in order for people to respond to me. And so that's something I do a lot of. You know, I probably post twice a week. And what I'm finding as a result of that is now if I do a call like this or say, for example, the project I had this week, other people will take a picture of that call and then write a post about me being on that particular call. Because when somebody else does a post about you, it's so much more powerful and it positions you as a credible expert in your space. And I find by doing things like this consistently, uh, by the time I step into a room, the, the hard sell, the pitches is, 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 is not done, but it's at a point where you, do, you don't have to pitch as much because they know you, they know your product, they know your service, they know what you're about. Uh, but they can also see then that you're a, a, a contributor. I often contribute to the rest of the community I'll talk to other people. I'll make an effort to network and to connect other people that I speak to. Uh, and by doing so, because I'm creating the connections online with other people I know, it then 
in a, it, it then introduces me to their, the networks as well. Mm -hmm. So would you say something I've been thinking about a lot, especially since we've all come online is when, so we do a, a demo day, essentially we do the core exchange every year and that's all about showing off the products and showing off the technology. And even though we are still able to do that online, I, I'm feeling like being the face and being the personality of your product has become more important than it has been in the past. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely, unequivocally. Yes, my practice is called Chatterbox, but did you engage me or Chatterbox? Mm. You engaged me, correct? Yes, I'm. <laughs> that's that's that, that that's what the brand is called. But I am Chatterbox, and and people. I feel people want to hear from the face behind the brand. They want to talk to the person who's behind the brand. They want to talk to to the to 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 the person who drives the brand, who who's who's the face of it, and so. I position the brand, the, I am the brand and the brand is me. And everything that I do and everything that I talk about and, and all the branding I have and all the strategies that I use is done specifically one, to show my personality, but also two, to show people that by engaging Chatterbox, you're also engaging Shill, who's the personality and the face of Chatterbox. And so, yes, Tessa, I think it is absolutely important to you know, if, if, if you're going to be the face of your brand, be the face of your brand. Uh, but then I also show my brand in different aspects. Uh, when it comes to LinkedIn, all the stuff I talk about is, is professional. And I, and I break it up into different categories. It's either it's educational or it's inspirational, motivational. You know, they're, they're the categories that I post my stuff in. I then have an Instagram page and on that page, it's the fun stuff that I do. It's the, it's, it's the stuff ups and the bloopers I have and the photos I have where I'm on stage and I'm doing this and a photographer just happens to catch me with my eyes closed. And I post that on my Instagram page because it's a different feel to me. And so I feel now more than ever, your online footprint is super important because when you talk to people, one of the first things that they do is they'll go have a look and see who you actually are. Are you the person you say you are? What's your LinkedIn profile like? Who are you connected to? You know, what's your website like? Does it show who, who, who you as a brand are? And when you put all of that together, uh, and, and if you can do it well, it's a really powerful combination because as soon as you step away from a conversation or if you go into a networking event and if you step out of the room, what are people say, saying about you? What are people doing when you've left the room? How much information do they have about you? you know, are, are they going to your LinkedIn profile? Are they going to your Instagram page? Are they Googling your name? Uh, this sounds a bit crazy, but I Google my name once every couple of months just to see what's, what's out there. And there's always stuff that is popping up and I'll call people and say, can you please take that down? Because I don't think it's a very good way to, you know, to, to, uh, the picture isn't good or there'll be some, something because I'm always aware of how important it is to have an online brand. So it's absolutely important. Yes. And on that note, I would encourage, I'm, 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 I'm sure you've heard this, but I would encourage people get into videos, um, you know, do, do videos, do more, you know, stick to a minute, a minute and a half, keep them short, sharp, and to the point. There's an app I use called Capwing. Have you heard of Capwing? Has anybody not come across Capwing? Or have you heard of Capwing? Just put a yes if you've heard of Capwing. No, okay. Capwing is an app that I use. So it's spelled K-A-P-W-I-N-G. And you know what? It's free. Capwing, that's right. K-A-P-W-I-N-G. It is free. You can upload your videos onto Capwing. 
it'll do your transcriptions for you it'll put your subtitles on for you and it will spit your video back with the subtitles embedded in an mp4 format free so i use capwing a lot you can pick the style of your subtitles you can pick the size the positioning you can crop your videos on there uh, I, I i don't know how long it'll be free for but while it is i would use it what i then do with things like today this this conversation today i will save this entire recording i'll then spend about an hour or two to go back through this conversation and i'll trim bits of this conversation into a, a minute a minute and a half into micro content i'll then brand the micro content under stuff like Speaking about Capwing, thank you very much for popping the link in there. I was going to do it, but thank you very much for doing that for me, Tessa. I'll then trim this up into micro content. And it could even be when I was talking to Hamish about the what, the why, and the why. And I could trim a minute of that and post that online. And it could be under the heading, you know, the three steps to structuring a speech. Understand your what, your why, and your why. And then all it is is me speaking about it with the subtitles, but I get all of that back from Capital. And so I do quite a bit of that because video content, if it's done in a minute to a minute and a half, if it's short, sharp information, people will watch it. Uh, however, when you do do a video, just remember, because there's so much content out there, Attention spans aren't too long, and generally you've got three seconds to make an impression. If you don't make an impression in three seconds, people aren't going to watch it. So if you are going to record a video, I would encourage you to not say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Today, I just wanted to take a moment to jump on and talk to you about, because you've lost them. You've lost them. Think about your opening line. So for every presentation, whether it's a pitch or a workshop or a TED talk or a keynote presentation, there are two anchor points, the way you start and the way you finish. The way you start is the first thing people are going to hear and it sets the tone for the rest of your presentation. The way you finish is the last thing your audience is going to hear. And in between that, some people might switch off, some people might check their phones or might need to go to the bathroom, but if the two, if, if it's the beginning and the end that everybody should hear, make them really interesting. And especially when it comes to online, when it comes to videos, make your first three to five seconds really interesting. If you want to tell them about a piece of technology, start with something super interesting. Get them in and then tell your story. But give it a strong ending as well. Don't waste people's time by, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to say thank you so much for tuning into my video today. And people haven't got time for that. There are millions of people who are dropping content every second. And so how are you going to stand out? What's, 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 uh, uh, adjust your tone, adjust your eye contact, have a script, practice that script a couple of times, and then have, have some fun. You know, don't speak on camera like, like this and say that you're thankful for people's time because you, you, you do that, you've lost it. No. <laughs> but I encourage you to do things like that. Uh, I encourage you to, you know, take a picture of events. Oh, and on that note, if you do take a screenshot of a Zoom call, a lot of people are doing that at the moment. Uh, to go back to Conrad's point earlier about online etiquette, if you do it, ask your audience if it's okay. You know, drop it into the chat and say, can I take a screenshot of everybody? Give people a chance to, you know, just to, to sit straight or blow their nose or smile or fix their hair or something. Because I've seen an awful lot of screenshots where there's one person doing this and it's just, it's not very good. <laughs> and it's quite embarrassing for the one person. And so ask, seek permission, and then ask if it's okay to put that online because not everybody is okay with it. And when you do put it online, if you do put it online, don't just say, great to be part of an event today with a picture because that's not going to generate interest. Write a story behind it. 
you know, explain to people what the event's about, tag people into your post, but write a story behind it. Start telling stories about your, your photos or your videos and frame them in a way that gives your audience some context so that they understand. Uh, because if they don't understand, and if it's simply a, in the current environment, great to be at an event which was, which was held by core. There's so much of that, they'll just flick straight past it. So be conscious. What can you say about today? Uh, if you wanted to post about today or perhaps another event that you go to, what can you say about that that's really going to stand out? So as people are going through their their feed, another one, another one, ooh, well, that's interesting. So hook people in the first couple of seconds. Do you have any questions? Do you have a question about that specifically? Because if you do, I'm more than happy to answer those as well. No one? Okay. I'll also add this then. With Capwing, uh, there, there, there is an option to even upload what's called an SRT file. So S for Tom, R for, S for Tom, S for Shill, R for Roger, T for Tom, SRT file. If Capwing doesn't pick up your transcriptions, then what I normally do, what, what I've done at times is I've uploaded the video onto YouTube. That then does my subtitles for me. I just have to edit them. I then download the file in, in SRT from my YouTube, and I upload that SRT component into Capwing. It's, it takes me a bit longer, but it's still a free way of doing it. Josh, you turn your mic off. You wanted to say something? Uh, so can you say that again? So you, you're uploading it into YouTube to produce the, um, the transcript or the, um, the, the text overlay, and then that produces a file that works in Capwing? Yes. So if Capwing struggles to pick up your, 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 sub your, your audio, your voice, yeah. and it's happened to me from time to time, I upload the video onto YouTube. Okay, it generally will take about uh, in anywhere from a couple of hours to a day, all depending on the size and quality of your audio. Once that's done, you then go onto YouTube just to fix up all the text because because there might be a couple of areas to tidy up. You then save that file and download it in an SRT. Save the SRT onto your desktop. Upload that file into Capwing, and Capwing will automatically blend that in with your video. Probably adds a little bit of time onto it. However, I would rather it gets done right. Because you know, I, 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 uh, I, I've seen a couple of videos online where people are at, actually speaking in front of an audience at events that I was at. And if the transcriptions aren't picked up correctly, I mean, there's been times where the word penis has appeared quite a few times, <laughs> quite a few times. And I thought, ooh, that's, uh, <laughs> is that an engagement hack? Or because I don't remember you saying penis, but it's appeared a few times. <laughs> so go back, tidy it up, be conscious of it, unless it's an engagement hack, because for some reason people find the word penis funny. <laughs> um. YouTube lets you post videos privately, but the, it's, it's just a, you know, anyone with the link can view it. Do you know of any um, platforms that are free that'll let you post a video that are password protected? Vimeo. Oh, Vimeo you can? Vimeo, I'm pretty sure you can on Vimeo. Nice. I use that. I use Vimeo. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I can second that. So Vimeo has apparently got much better privacy restrictions and if you set it to private, it actually stays private, whereas for yeah. most people, I don't think YouTube, even on private, is really that private. Yeah. No. I also like the fact that when you put things onto Vimeo, you have an option to, because with YouTube, once your video ends, it's, it sometimes starts to default onto, onto other things that are online, whereas you've got the ability to stop that with, Vimeo, and you can actually stop your video when it's supposed to end, and 
the other ones, the, the, if you choose to add something onto the end of it, it can take your audience to other things which you've done, the videos which you've done. So that's a functionality about it I like as well. Yeah. There is a small cost, isn't there, Shil? I want to say like $300 a year or something. Is that yeah, there, there is a small cost to it. Like for like, though, if you're paying the same amount to upgrade to YouTube Premium, I feel it's, it's again, it's, this is a personal thing. I, I, I would rather do it onto Vimeo than YouTube for those reasons, Renee. Does YouTube Premium give you password protection? YouTube, I don't think it gives you password protection, but it does allow you to restrict the the, the links. Hmm. It's more about that auto suggestion afterwards. So when they've watched your video, it just it follows it with some random like blowing up Lego video or something. Whereas if you've yeah. got Vimeo, then you can you can have it suggest your other videos instead of some something random. Correct. Correct. So if you're going to start to build up a portfolio, a lot of people go to YouTube. However, I've decided to go down the Vimeo route. And so I upload a lot of content onto Vimeo when I use that to, uh, what I, what I also don't do is post links to Vimeo or to YouTube on my LinkedIn platform, uh, because for some reason it doesn't like to take people off the platform. So if you are going to post a video on there, do it in file in your own mp4 file uh, because the and, and i don't know how the algorithm works i'm not a linkedin expert however i found anytime i post something well when i did in the past which takes you off the platform to youtubes to vimeos they don't perform as well as the ones which are done in a native format So if you are going to post your video content, do it in a native format. Um, I have to run, but this has been great. Thanks, Shil. No problem. Um, are you posting this? I've got a bunch of people in my cohort that would benefit from seeing it. Yeah. Or is that a question for Tessa? According to Tessa. Uh, mm -hmm. This recording will also have the fall and the stumble. So when you watch it, be aware of that. I did turn my video off, but that is included in this. So we'll keep it raw so everybody can see that I actually fell during this session today. <laughs> Brilliant. They can, you can slice it into a blooper reel at the end. Oh, I'm going to keep it in. <laughs> People see it. It happens. It's okay. <laughs> okay. I'll just cut Thanks, it out. Just my <laughs> Thank you for coming, Josh. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. I think that's everything, Tessa. I think that's all the questions. Yeah, um, unless anyone has anything else, um, now's your opportunity. Cool. Um, thank you so much, Shell. This was really helpful, and I think I've learned a lot, and I have some things I'm going to be thinking about and practicing. Uh, staring into the camera is one of those things. Um, there's just a little green light. I'm going to have to put a sticker with a face or something there. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the green light. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out um, or t logging on, I should say. This has been a really great first uh, webinar for us here at CORE and that's a big thanks to CORE for helping make this such a success. Um, if anyone is interested, we're doing our networking drinks tonight. If anyone wanted to log on at 4.30 um, Australia Western time for those of us on the opposite coast. Um, so I hope you'll join us there and you can find chill, 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 <laughs> chill, chill on uh, <laughs> LinkedIn and Instagram and I'll share those links um, with you so you can um, connect with Shell after this. Mm -hmm.